You are listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for episode 155 is Melvin Gibbs, known as one of the best bass players in the world. We're hearing him right now on the 1980 album Defunct by the band Defunct. The song is Melvin's Tune. Since then, he's appeared on over 200 albums, including as a band member of Rollins Band in the 90s. Arto Lindsay's work from the mid-90s to the present with John Zorn, DJ Logic, Elliot Sharp, Vitamin C, the Zigzag Power Trio, which is members of Living Color, and many others. The interview is prompted by his recent solo release, 4 Plus 1 Equals 5, for May 25th. The song is Get Some, featuring the rapper Kakai. He's released five albums since the late 90s with the trio Harriet Tubman. We'll talk about The Terror End of Beauty, the title track from their most recent in 2018, and then look back to another trio, Power Tools, with Bill Frizzell and Ronald Shannon Jackson. The song is Howard Beach Memoirs, Melvin's composition from their one album, Strange Meeting, 1987. We'll conclude with Canto Por Odudua, credited to Melvin Gibbs' Elevated Entity, from their 2009 release, Ancient Speak. For more, see music.melvin-gibbs.com or just look him up on Bandcamp. You'll reach the same place. For more about this podcast, see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com and you can support the podcast and get ad-free versions of these either through patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic or by becoming a paid subscriber via Apple Podcasts. I will play a little bit of Melvin's tune from Defunct from their first album, 1980, to introduce folks to you. That was a very, obviously, a group-oriented thing. Vocals on most of it, not on this particular song. Mm-hmm. You have a very thick bass sound on a lot of that. Do you remember what you're playing through at this point? A phaser or something? I had an MXR synth pedal. Okay, so that is doubling the acoustic sound, or it's actually substituting for it? I don't know exactly <laughs> what, <laughs> okay. what it does. I didn't look in the filter, but I can tell you sonically, it sounds more like a filter situation than a doubling situation. Yeah, so we're going to get pretty quickly to your latest thing, but... It was nice that we had that initial funk thing because we're having some of that same spirit as opposed to rambling freeform jazz (laughs) that has been a lot of the middle that's getting right to from your 4 plus 1 equals 5 album. Did you want to say a little about that (laughs) very, very long journey to get from the beginning to here or is that too... Yeah, no, we can talk about that. Was this something that you were kind of retaining that more song-oriented funk thing that we're seeing on the new thing sort of throughout, but a lot of your gigs have been it seems like you're participating in many traditions at once as a really good bass player who is going where the opportunities are i've always wanted to do a lot of different things Mm -hmm. and back in the 80s and the way things were structured back then it was always more a question of to sell something you had to like brand it so you were stuck with doing one thing Mm. and if you made one record in one style and another record in another style then you don't have a career So my way to hack that back then was to just do a lot of different things with other people and not worry so much about what it looked like from the branding side. As the business changed and as music evolved, it started to become easier to kind of put the things together. And it started to become easier, especially when, you know, the idea of using pseudonyms or whatever. The idea that one person could do many different kinds of music is not such a big deal. I remember the first time I went to England, I did an interview with melody maker or enemy or whatever and i was playing with a person from my neighborhood who was then had a top 10 record an r&b singer and literally the interviewer was insulted that i played other kinds of music besides r&b so that's kind of what you were dealing with back then all right for this recent thing i mean you haven't published a lot under your own name over the years and it's been a while was this ep a creature of well obviously the george floyd situation but also just the pandemic The EP itself was basically a response to the creative moment. I was watching the kids out in the street and I was listening to the music and just like 60s protest music just didn't seem like it did the job. And for the kids, it wasn't doing the job either because they were just based in New York. Everybody was like out in the streets chanting pop smoke songs. And they would just change the lyric when you got to something offensive and change it with George Floyd or whatever. That's kind of how they did it. So that kind of showed me, okay, music is usually ahead of the people, but this was a situation where music was behind the people. So that kind of gave me a mission of something, okay, this is something I can actually participate in. So that's when I decided to kind of jump in and make some music that captured that. So we're going to play the tune Get Some, which is the fourth track off here, featuring as all the ones that have lyrics do Kokai. So how did you 
hook up with him in particular for this project? Well, that's a long story that goes <laughs> back into the adults of time and the OOs. I produce hip hop stuff too. This is what I'm saying. It's kind of like people in the jazz world don't know that I do hip hop. People in the rock world don't know that I do jazz. People in the hip hop world don't know that I do either. But I produced a record back in the 90s by a group that's an obscure classic, a group called People Without Shoes from the Bronx. So I know how to make beats. I've been making beats. You know, I played on Dead Press's first record. I mean, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from that time. So it's just because I didn't do it for a living. I was doing other stuff. I was interested. Again, like I'm saying, I'm interested in all kinds of things. But having said that, in the OOs, I worked on the soundtrack for a movie that didn't end up coming out. And I made this track for the theme song. The filmmaker decided to bring in Kakai as the voice for it. And I just, it's one of the best things that I've ever done. I just kind of file that away as like, okay, me and Kakai work together great. And Kakai actually has a history not that different than mine. Kakai is sort of like the underground phenom of the DC scene. People think he does thing X, but he also does thing Y. This thing, I really wanted to have him because I really wanted to have an older rapper because I wanted an old voice because I felt like that's my position. You know, I didn't want to try to like fake making some kid rap. And I also feel like in the position of the people in my age group had something to offer to this situation. So that's why I specifically got somebody who was kind of in my age group who kind of understood the same influence as I did and would have an older voice on purpose. But one who also can speak to the kids because he's kind of a mentor of a lot of the D.C. rappers that are popular now. Listen, I told him to come and get some. You don't really want it, want it. Get some. You don't really want it, uh. Get some, you don't really want it, want it. Get some, you don't really want it. It's the ambassador, boy, I'm more like Pastor Troy. I beseech ye, brethren, y'all can get destroyed. National Guard, the passionate mob, the khaki fan boys is all deployed. Big Floyd, rest with the angels, they finally convict some. But we still on the danger, for they get that one, two more, get that gun, three more lives, tree born lives. My fruit dangle at the angle, we don't need more signs. They don't recognize until they convicts with the COs catching the honey seats inside. Linen sheets is tied, all for nine minutes. Clout, we ain't finished. Thin blue lines turn to deep minutes. Tasers ain't guns, murder was intended. Body cam, the eyewitness. It's all trauma, circle back, it's all karma. Well past the margins, I speak without commas. My punctuation is highly graded, Eclipse Banana. For them alphabets I'm holding in my basement CDs. New neighbors ain't strangers, we out at the ranges. Send a mask for the silence class, for the shadow band. We know about shouts and the harlots. We know about all black dollars. Oklahoma, Wall Street, and Georgia farmers. Black steel in an hour, KRs, hay balls. Two minutes, Shawshank. We ain't tenants, the green mouth. No magic niggas. We ain't sick, you sick. We ain't tricked, you, you get. The rabbit got the shot in, he don't miss. Remember his foot on your keys, good luck with it. Till it unload the ratchet and your life he fixed. Cause you can come and get some. You don't really want it, want it. Get some. You don't really want it, want it. Get some. You don't really want it, want it. Get some. You don't really want it, want it.
Let's. Yeah, so there's eventually, you know, a bass solo that comes in. Everything before that is programmed, or does some of those sub very, very low tones originally come from a bass before it got into the computer there? To me, it's all bass. <laughs> I mean, I played a lot. I was talking about all the different things I've done. I was in a band called Social Librium with uh, Bernie Worrell, who actually pioneered that synthesizer bass thing. And I came up in Brooklyn, New York, played a lot of reggae when I was a kid. You know, I got introduced to that music and I felt it. So it's for me, it's more about the science of the bass as a frequency ring. And sometimes it's better to use, you know, the bass guitar. And sometimes it's better to use some kind of synthesized instrument. And for this track, I felt it was better to use a synthesized instrument for the low, low, lowest, lowest stuff. When you do your programming, are you just doing it with a little keyboard next to you? Or are you so, because you're so comfortable with bass, do you just, you know, have some sort of MIDI setup or, you know, whatever that, so you can have the option of entering things more quickly? I mean, MIDI bass never really worked. I'm actually one of the early adopters of Ableton Live, which is a common software people use now. I'm actually probably one of the first, if not, not first people to use it. I used it in Sonar. I guess I had version one. And before they figured it out how to even hook a keyboard up to it properly, you could actually just use the computer keys to input stuff. So sometimes I just do that. It's funny because I've actually tried to do stuff on the phone. Working on the phone doesn't work for me, but I'm very used to just using the, the keyboard. You know, I'm used to the early way you had to use work able to, because for me, it's very similar to the way I was taught to operate the recording studio by like my mentors. When I'm working, I work pretty much the way a dub producer does, even if it doesn't sound like that. Can you say anything about that initial, uh, I just wrote, dark wash, this synth thing that breathes in and out? I mean, it's an interesting sound. Is it really just a matter of that's the way the sound was designed? Or how much control do you have over its throbbing <laughs> exactly when it's coming in and out? Is that very manual or is some of that, you know, just kind of part of the sound that you picked? I told him come and get some. You don't really want it, want it. Get some. That's more of a composed sound. That's the sound that I made using a couple of different softwares. That's the other thing that people don't know. One of my other talents is I'm actually a pretty decent sound designer, like in a traditional like movie making sense. I've actually worked a lot with a person who has now become a very famous artist, if not the most famous artist right now, a man named Arthur Jaffa. And I did the music slash sound design for a He's had two laps around the art world, and I did the music and sound design for most of his early work. And I actually just did a piece for him, which I'll be releasing the soundtrack for that next year on a label called Editions Migo, which is known as more of a sort of noise, more like art music as opposed to music music. So again, talking about all the different, you know, I just kind of have a wide range of what I do musically. So anyway, that piece, because I was in the school, I spent a lot of time in George Floyd Square. I really wanted to capture something that sounded like how it felt to me. So I had to actually kind of sit down and compose this thing. It started with some simps, but it's been through a lot of software iterations and a lot of traditional kind of sound design work to get it to sit the way it sits. It started off as an improv and then the improv was, you know, it's kind of like a modernization of the way Tio Macero made the Miles Davis records. You have a bunch of improv and then you chop the improv up and you turn it into a composition. Well, it sounds very design. I mean, the drum sounds are pretty strange in that it's this little tiny hi-hat and the snare is only a little bigger than the hi-hat. Like it's definitely not your normal, like the snare is taking up the space so that you can give so much to this dub bass sound and then is that kind of a bongo like thing that's sort of interacting with the dub bass there it's the ambassador for oh, i'm more like past troy i beseech ye brethren y'all can get destroyed national guard the passionate mob the khaki family. that's kind of taking more of the sonic space than just this little you know that's just keeping the beat but there's no backbeat or anything pounding in there yeah, well, that's what I learned from being around dub producers. It's like the secret of how you get the bass to sound big in a track and how you design the track so that people focus on this. Yeah, all of that is purpose. All the, the instrument sonic choices, it's all on purpose. It's not necessarily to for some sort of pop purpose. So this drum sounds like the drum that X person used on such records so you'll recognize that it. it's really more kind of like okay I'm trying to do this thing with the bass so everything else has to work with that and that's kind of where it landed but the other thing with that 
track again because I have an older rapper and I'm older. I really wanted it to, to have a kind of almost like a throwback groove, but that you wouldn't hear that it's a throwback groove. It's not the kind of straight kind of like track groove or a London drill groove. It's almost more like a Stevie Wonder groove in that sense. And also the same thing with the keys. I wanted the keys to kind of be reminiscent of something soul era, but a modernization of it. And were you coming into it with some of the lyrics, like the get some, you know, obviously not the rap that Kokai was doing, but the main vocal licks, was that part of your composition or was it, or did you write it strictly instrumental and then, okay, here's the structure, figure out, you know, a number of verses that will actually fit over it. Well, I gave him a structure and then it wasn't even a question of a bunch of verses. You know, I told him what I was doing with the project. I told him was based on George Floyd and we had talked about one concept. And I guess the verdict came through and I called him the next day and said, hey, the verdict came through. We need I need to wrap this thing up differently. And we kind of talked about what that would look like. And then that's what he wrote. I sent him a sort of bare bones version of the track so he could do whatever he wanted. And then once he did his thing, I kind of sat back and then put the track together around what he had done. Okay. I moved a couple of things what he did, but it's sort of a back and forth. Well, yeah, I noticed he had like a couple of his lines or doubled or something, but that sounds digital, you know, where you would have the hype man, you know, the second rapper that joins just to double a couple lines. But I assume you just did all that electronically or did he like overdub a little bit? He did that all the, I mean, he's a producer in his own right. He was nominated for a Grammy as an R&B producer. So he knows how to make tracks. Just He did his part and it was up to me to kind of decide, okay, what am I going to use and what I'm not going to use? And for that particular track, I thought the hype stuff worked. So we used it. And just in terms of the context, I mean, so it's five tunes on this, and this is right after 327, which is, you know, a super dramatic piece in that it has these, it's almost like a political version of John Cage's Four Minutes of Silence. Is that what it was called? You know, that you've got these gaps in the song to demonstrate, you know, this is how long George Floyd was going without air. And so Get Some is like the thing that has to follow that, you know, stark, just stabbed to the heart. So I guess I'm asking, was this the order of the songs? Was that an afterthought or was this sort of written as like a thing that would be a little bit of relief from that previous track? Well, I mean, the sequencing came after. I mean, the day that the doctor gave the testimony, I made the 327 track that night. I was just like, okay, I have to do this. And Kakai had already had the track that became Get Some. But then, you know, we talked about it a bit. And then, like I said, once the verdict came through, then he kind of wrote that thing. And I mean, you got to remember people were celebrating, you know, not celebrating because somebody actually got killed that very day in Minneapolis. But it was kind of a relief. I mean, knowing full well that there's going to be more people killed or whatever. And it's just like, but all of that is what went into him writing that track. So it kind of naturally felt that that would be the thing that would go afterwards. So that's kind of how I did it. I guess if the verdict had been different, then you could end with that 327 and just leave it like this completely stark, depressing. Yeah. Well, okay. So one more thing about this, a traditional electric bass solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Traditional for you, I guess. But, you know, with a very staccato, you're slapping or you're just hitting hard with your fingers. How are you getting this sound approximately? I'm just playing. I mean, it's traditional in the sense that I'm actually playing an instrument that people are used to, <laughs> to seeing being played, but it's definitely not, wouldn't be traditional to put a solo on top of that kind of track. I don't even think Thundercat has done that yet. You know what I mean? I think that even though he's the most forward looking of the bass players at this point, I think that for me, it was kind of like I had this thing, again, like I said, I wanted it to really be a statement from the older generation, kind of talking to and with the younger generation. So I was kind of like, okay, let me do something that is going to make people say, hey, I didn't really expect this. I thought about a couple of friends of mine who are really great musicians to kind of make the final statement. And then it was kind of just like, you know what, I need to just go ahead and do this myself. And then I jumped up and I did it. And that's what it was. And I just decided to have it. The thing about recording bass is that it can sound drastically different in different situations. So I kind of just decided to just really go for a kind of really stark what's the word i'm looking for well i mean it's a trebly sound because you already have the bass area full from with other stuff yeah so it, it was just really kind of like a sound that as a bass player you wouldn't be attracted to in a sense but again like everything else in the track is a question of what the totality of the track is accomplishing and i just felt it was the right sound for the track because it's kind of percussive 
but it's not slapping. It speaks in a different kind of way. And it needed to have that vocal quality, but it couldn't be a wah-wah. It couldn't be like the corny kind of like the usual things when people think of vocal kind of sound. So I wanted to have something that was a little more kind of African in a kind of way that's kind of spoke differently. So that's that's where I landed. Toward the end of the solo, since the whole thing is a drone, right? It's basically one chord. But then you do that jazz thing where because you're playing a solo instrument over this big wash, then you can leave the key. And so you're playing through a few different modes and it really expands it out, you know, in a very jazz way, a way that I don't normally hear on a hip hop song, for instance. I mean, can you say a little about making that decision to, okay, I'm going to kind of play in the chord in a traditional way for a while, for a good 30, 40 seconds, and then it's going to start backing out into other territory. Well, that was my thing about being an uncle and like what information uncles have that the kids don't have. It's kind of like, yeah, it's not something that you would hear on a normal track, but obviously it's something you can do on a normal. Mm-hmm. So it was really kind of a way, okay, this is how we think about this music. And this expansion is really kind of a reflection of the expansion. It's kind of like an answer to what Kakai was saying over the course of the piece, you know, just talking, okay, today is the first day. Okay. We finally, after all of these years, we got a, a guilty verdict. But we got to keep expanding and the people of America have to keep expanding and their idea of what can be done with this music and with black people needs to be expanded. And that's kind of not to make it overly dramatic, but that's just kind of what the jazz tradition is about. And it's something we don't, you know, people don't talk about it because you don't think about it because you come up in a tradition, but it's built into tradition that you take these forms that are understandable forms that come from the black community and you can do all kinds of things with it. And that's kind of what I did. Well, let's move a little further into that history by by moving back pre-pandemic to uh, your band Harriet Tubman from their latest album, The Terror End of Beauty, 2018. We're going to listen to the title track. Can you give us a little intro to this trio with Brandon Ross on guitar and JT Lewis on drums? This was your fifth album with them. It's been ranging over a lot of years and several different sounds within this. Can you say a little about where you were at with this album and this track in particular? The conceit of Tubman is that Tubman is a free jazz band. Put it another way, we're people who are schooled in the traditions of people call free jazz spontaneous composition, whatever you want to call it. I spent a lot of time around on Arnett Coleman. Both Brandon and JT were in Henry Threadgill's band who won a Pulitzer Prize as a composer. So we have all of this information about high level compositional techniques within us, but we're all children of rock and roll, soul, me, hip hop, you know, JT as well. JT was actually in Herbie Hancock's Rocket Man. We're all a generation younger than those guys. So we approach those ideas using the music we grew up on. And that's the basic conceit. So it doesn't sound like free jazz to people because we're not using the instruments that people associate free jazz, but we're using the thought process of spontaneous composition, of expansion, of the things that we got from, like I said, Threadgill, Ornette, P-Funk, you know, the guys in Detroit who, me coming up in the early days of hip hop and just and working with poets, all of those types of improvisation kind of inform what we do. And they end in what we call spontaneous composition. The Terra and the Beauty is actually a rare exception to that. And the Terra and the Beauty comes from someone else that I spent a lot of time playing with, who people, ironically enough, people have actually become really interested in because of this movie that Questlove made about the festival in Harlem. And that's a man named Sonny Sherat, who is the guitar player who has that basically cameo in the movie where he just goes off and he just goes insane on the guitar. I played with that man for years. I'm on one album here, but I was in his band for five years. Yeah, Seize the Rainbow. I was just listening to that yesterday. That is a crazy great album. So this song, Terra and the Beauty, is basically written for him. And it's written with this idea of kind of a homage to what he brought to us, what we brought to the music. The tune has been around a while and I hadn't played it. And I was in a store 
funny enough, I heard some 4AD record. Maybe it was, I can't remember if it was my funny Valentine or one of those kind of 4AD groups. And then I was kind of like, okay, it's time to bring this song back up. So it just so happened when it was time to record, we had played it for a long time and I was like, it's time to play the song again. And we pulled it out and that's where it landed. From one generation, it's free jazz. For another generation, it would almost be like some 4AD thing, but it's kind of neither. It's really kind of like our graduate thesis in great black music. Thank you. 
That is very cool. Before we talk about that song, I need to do my ad break. Since you're listening to this show, I think it's safe to say you love listening to podcasts, right? Well, you'll find a ton of binge-worthy podcasts, including ours, on Amazon Music, with more than 10 million free podcast episodes to listen to. But of course, Amazon Music isn't just for listening to podcasts. They have thousands of music stations and playlists to stream for free. And no matter what you're listening to, you can go hands-free with Alexa. If you're like me and you want your music on demand and free, you have to try Amazon Music Unlimited. That gives you unlimited access to over 75 million songs, as well as podcasts, music videos, and more. You can listen to any song, anywhere. You can listen to them offline. You don't have to hear ads. You can skip around between songs. Whatever your current strategy for getting music right now is, this is a great time to try out Amazon Music Unlimited. Because for just a little while, new customers can try it out free for 30 days. With no credit card required, just go to Amazon.com slash N-E-M-P-O-D. That's Amazon.com slash N-E-M-P-O-D to try Amazon Music Unlimited free for 30 days. Amazon.com slash N-E-M-P-O-D renews automatically, cancel anytime, terms apply. Also, I want to tell you about the Nebia by Moen Spa Shower. Backed by some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley, including Tim Cook, it's designed by former Tesla, NASA, and Apple engineers who spent years researching and developing a superior shower experience that saves water and is anything but ordinary. And I have installed and used one of these. It is very much like a spa. It sprays 81% more power from the competition. It fills up the space with atomized droplets that rinse shampoo and conditioner even out of the thickest hair. It is highly luxurious. It is highly immersive. And it moves up and down, so... When you need a break from that, you just move it down so you can put your head above it and breathe. So, good experience. Second big selling point, use 45% less water. You will save money. You will help the environment. The water savings aspect is why these very smart engineers have been so passionate about developing this thing. Finally, super easy to install. You can put it in 15 minutes or less. No plumbers, no contractors, no breaking tiles. It is cool looking with four premium finishes to complement any bathroom. They have other sleek and sustainable bathroom accessories like shower shelves, shower curtains, hooks, and bath mats. The Nebia by Moen Shower Spa starts at just $199, and for Nakedly Examined Music listeners, we have a deal for you. The first 100 people to use code NEM at Nebia.com will get 10% off all Nebia products. Again, that's Nebia.com slash NEM, and use that code NEM to save 10%. All right, let's get back to my talk with Melvin Gibbs about the Harriet Tubman song, The Terror End of Beauty. Yeah, so we got that very uh, classic jazz, 70s jazz, light jazz, you know, that very nice with you playing chords. So you're playing, well, are you playing a six string, a, a five string bass? At this point, I'm playing a five. I had a six. I don't play the six anymore. I'm just with the five now. I wasn't even sure at first if Brandon was playing guitar with you when you start, because it's so, you know, the bass is dominating in the mix for that, at least at the beginning, you know, so that there's room for him to sort of poke out more later. With you two playing those chords and the, the drums answering and this just nice bright swing. Okay, but then we have the B section, this la la la, and then this giant ruckus. Let me actually just play a little bit of that. Again, it sounds like we're continuing on this. You mentioned My Funny Valentine, but like this classic jazz. Duh, duh, duh. Uh, but then we have these tremolos as if it was the end of the song. <laughs> but no, no, this is just the B section, and you're going to repeat this, and it is going to end up, the second time you do it, being only a very slight transition to a bridge that really is completely free jazz, where you guys are just, especially the drums, are just going nuts for a couple of minutes in there. Let me rephrase. If I said my funny Valentine, I was incorrect. I meant my bloody Valentine. My bloody Valentine. All right. Well, I'm associating this with nice 60s, 70s. The conceit is that Sonny himself was very into doo-wop music, right? Mm -hmm. And Sonny's thing was he's a really Sonny, you know, like a lot of the great people we associate with free jazz, like Arnett. Sonny was really great at coming up with melodies. Mm -hmm. And I decided, again, with the point of Tubman being, okay, we're going to take stuff that our mentors taught us and we're going to modernize it for our generation. I decided, well, Sonny's thing is do up. Let me just do kind of like a 70s R&B thing. So the basic head of it is kind of just like your a sort of classic 70s R&B progression, like the Delphonics or Blue Magic or somebody like that would sing on top of. But Sonny's thing was always like, okay, he would set up this thing and then he would crash it. So that's kind of what we did. We just took that idea and we kind of framed it within 
the music we grew up on, the same way Sunday Frame, what he did with the music he grew up on. Yeah, I could definitely see that B section being a vocal ensemble. La, da, da, da. But then, obviously, the voices are not going to go. La, 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 la. Are you finger picking when it comes to this middle section? So you've been playing kind of just this, but it moves to a definite finger picking three note, you know, some definite like now this is the anchor. So the other guys can play a million notes a second, but like this is going to be holding steady. So was this part planned or was this really just a free jazz? No, it's planned. It's a, that part is what's free is the response is free. But it's a construction, you know, like I said, it's this thing that is designed to be deconstructed. And it's a particular, you know, something has for a certain set of people would have a particular emotional resonance. I mean, I'm old enough to have been able to see like Farrell Saunders at his peak. And he always had this combination of he would have these kind of really spiritual things and these really forward reaching things. This thing, freedom, even today is still a goal, but even it was even more of a goal back then. So it was kind of like you had the idea that the people in the room that were listening to Frau Son is going to get to do whatever they want, basically required that the whole structure of the country fall down. You know what I mean? So the music kind of reflected that that deconstruction thing is really sort of metaphorical deconstruction of when you go outside and you get stopped by the cops or whatever. It's like, no, we're not putting up with that right now. That's kind of what that aspect of what Frau doing represented. Of course, For us, it means different things, but that idea that the structure has to come down for us to be free. Down is a bit, maybe not down, I mean, but even looking at the kids going out in the street last year, I mean, that's kind of what they were saying. It's like, you're going to move things or we're going to move things. And really, for me, that tradition of free jazz represents that. And that's kind of what is happening there in that track. You have this substructure and people are kind of deconstructing it. But underneath it, it's kind of like this song, like, Okay, almost like a inspirational chant that people can use to kind of find a way to rearrange the structure in a way that's still going to be loving when it's done, as opposed to just pulling something down and everything's burning and then nobody can go forward. You know, that's one of the main ingredients or one of the main purposes of what we call free jazz is to actually do that. But I wanted to do that within the context of our generation and play with some of the associations like people will hear it. Like I said, they'll hear it, you know, think my bloody Valentine, the world's lightest band or whatever. They might hear it that way because times have changed and that sort of deconstruction has become more popular. But I wanted to kind of have a little poetry going on there just in terms of how people will look at it. The interaction between the three of you. So there's a certain point about 340 in where the guitar has been soloing or has this growing noise for a while. But at a certain point, he just... In a similar way to we were talking at the the end of the last song where you sort of leave that chord, he definitely leaves the key. Right there, that... And then from then on, like he's dive bombing. I mean, you're holding that pattern pretty straight, but then... Between him dive bombing the drums, shifting to a different whole beat every once in a while, and then back to the the fluttering with you. Yeah, it gets pretty chaotic. And the fact that it can then settle back down to not quite the same as the beginning, because the drums are still like, he's way more jittery by this point <laughs> than, that, than when you were doing the A and the B section from the beginning. But you know, it's still more or less calms back down to where it started to this. Yeah, so it's a nice, nice merger of those two things you were talking about. Well, the more or less is kind of like, hopefully we were able to jigger the structure. And then when you come back, it's like, it works the way it's supposed to, as opposed to like, it's not working right. That would be my metaphorical two cents of that in terms of coming back. But again, you know, you have these kind of conventions of what people call free music and the conventions, as I said earlier, they're really about a way of thinking about structure and pulling the structure apart. And for us, there's a thing, I always say that in a way like free jazz you know, in the wrong hands is actually the most rigid music Mm -hmm. because then it just becomes a series of things that you've heard other people do that you are naming free jazz as opposed to actually being, okay, what are we doing now? So that section of the song was, I mean, when I played with Sonny Chirac, when we recorded the record, I think we rehearsed once 
before we went in the studio. And for that song, we purposely didn't rehearse because I didn't want anybody to feel like, oh, I mean, we've played the song before. So it's not like we had never played the song before, but I wanted it to just be like, okay, we're playing this song. This is what we did. And we're not going to think about it ahead of time. We're going to play it and it's going to be what it's going to be. And then that's it. There might have been two takes of that song, but I remember correctly, that was the only time we played it. And that was the whole point of that exercise to kind of stay true to the way Sonny taught me how to deal with this music and to stay true to what Sonny was trying to bring to the music, even back in the 60s, Herbie Man or whatever. It's like his whole thing was like, okay, I'm trying to show you what it's like to be free. But there's another conceit in that, which is that Sonny had this quote that's kind of a famous quote attributed to him where he talks about his music is supposed to show the terror and the beauty. And we kind of flipped that a bit to call the record the terror and the beauty. But that's also what I used was my experience hang gliding, which is I went hang gliding once off the cliff in Rio. And there's this point where, you know, the funny part was we had to rehearse it a few times because I didn't have to run together. When you hang glide the first time, you hang out with somebody else. You're not going solo. You know, you're not just jumping off by yourself. But the person who I was rehearsing with was going to, if you, you got to practice this run, because if you run this way, we're going to die. So we practiced a few times and we ran. And it's this thing, it's almost like a Bugs Bunny thing where you run off the cliff and then you keep running, you know, like, like you see like in the cartoons. I'm running and I'm running. I'm off the cliff and I'm running. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And then the air catches and you're floating. Right. And that's kind of like the feeling, the next iteration of what, you know, the free jazz guys and what Sonny's trying to do. It's like you have this thing that you don't know where it's going. And then it kind of morphs into this really beautiful thing or morphs out of that really beautiful thing back into the other thing. And that's kind of what the point is. That's one of the things we're trying to capture. We try to capture in the music in general, and one of the things we try to capture in particular in that song. Well, let's get the third song out there, which I thought was a really interesting one to compare with what we just heard. So you had picked Howard Beach Memoirs from Power Tools, from the your one and only studio album with them, Strange Meeting, 1987. So this is Bill Frizzell guitar and Ronald Shannon Jackson, who you had played on many of his albums even overlapping this time how did that even work that you were in his band but now we're going to do a separate thing was it because bill initiated that project what is what is the background of that well the producer initiated the project a man called david breskin who was an old friend of the band and shannon and myself he decided he wanted to do a project he had already actually produced a record with bill frizzell and vernon reed one of my oldest friends called Smash and Scatteration. And he decided that he wanted to do a record with Bill, with Shannon and I. And one of his things was he knew that I had written a couple of compositions for Decoding Society. and He knew I was a good composer. So one of his things was everybody had to bring in tunes. So that was one that I brought in. And that one was specifically related to, unfortunately, you know, it's funny. What is this? literally 40 years, no, it's 30 years later, 80, that was 80, whatever. 87, yep. And it's the same problem. There was a kid in Howard Beach, Queens, who, I don't know if he got off the subway at the wrong stop, whatever. Anyway, he was crossing the street and a bunch of kids from the neighborhood came out and basically he ended up dead after. They basically killed him. And I think they ran him over with a car or whatever they did, you know, because he was a black man in the wrong place at the wrong time. So... This song was kind of my sort of reflection on that because I'm from New York from that era where where I grew up, my family was the second African-American family on the block. I always tell people that I'm the first black person that that whole side of Brooklyn ever encountered. So I very much resonated with this idea that you could walk down the wrong block and you could die because of somebody's prejudice that had nothing to do with whatever you did or didn't do. It's just like you were the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I kind of wrote this melody in a similar way to the terror and the beauty thing in in the sense of kind of like you're trying to negotiate this thing and you just don't really know how it's going to turn out. I wanted to capture this sort of pensiveness of like, okay, you know, New York is a beautiful place. Life is beautiful. And then you just, you literally don't know. That's the thing that I think that people realize now that they didn't realize. I mean, it's for an African-American male, at that time, and even today, these places that look like idyllic, the goal, you know, it's like a place with, okay, it's like white picket fence and it's like, a, you know, cul-de-sac. Those places can be deadly for black people. So the thing that's the actual goal for, you know, the quote, average American, unquote, could kill us. So that's, 
dichotomy is kind of what's written into this song. You know, and of course, I didn't go into all this with Bill because, you know, it's kind of like I'm not trying to color what Bill's thinking about playing this music because Bill is going to play what he's going to play. And that's what I wanted. But I mean, the title at the time, the title in itself kind of spoke for itself. And Bill kind of, he caught the vibe because, again, because I've had the training, because I've had the ingredients, it's kind of like the melody in and of itself kind of implied this tension. And then Shannon just went with it.
in terms of what you came in with, given that this was sort of a one-off project, are you coming in with a lead sheet, something to tell, for instance, Bill, what that melody is? Or did you hum it at him? Or how is it? No, I wrote the stuff out. Okay. All right. I, I mean, I wrote the stuff out because it had to make it fast. <laughs> when people know how to read music, it's faster just to write it out. Sometimes you'll get a more accurate interpretation if you sing it to them, but it's faster to write it out. So the songs that I brought to the table, they were written kind of traditionally. Shannon has a very particular style of notation that's kind of somewhat based on Ornette style, but not really, that you kind of have to know to navigate. But I had been in his band for years, so it was easy enough for me to navigate. So those songs, I kind of, Bill figured them out. And sometimes either Shannon or I would sing a part if it, if it was just too cryptic for Bill to, because it was the first time he was dealing with, with Shannon's notation style. And then Bill's tones were written out and we just knocked those out. So even Shannon's part in this? That no, I didn't write. I'm not writing, I'm not writing anything. Oh, you're not writing drum parts for him. What everybody wrote down was the melodies and sometimes, sometimes the chords, but not even that. Shannon never wrote chords. I didn't write any chords. I mean, the quarterly, the song kind of speaks for itself. I didn't really have to write. I think with one of Bill's songs, he actually had a chord progression written out. Shannon and I were coming out of, of Ornette's tradition of what's called harmonics, which is the melody dictates the harmony, not the other way around. So all you really need is a melody. And then it's up to you to figure out how to respond to that melody. You're not playing changes per se. Or even when exactly it's going to come in, because there's a lot of feel that it's like a drone that you're, you know, you and the Shannon are setting up this thing and then he can come in with that melody kind of at any point, <laughs> whenever it feels right, just come in with that thing and then take it from there. So it's more like you've written out a few bars. Here's a lot of content, not the song from beginning to end. That's an interesting thing because I would push back the other way. I would say it's not necessarily a song if you write it. You're just, it's just a bunch of music that you wrote down that somebody else is playing. I mean, that's, that's more a question of, that's a political question. It's kind of like, it's a song when people put it together and then they interact with it. There's a whole different tradition at that point. I mean, that that's its own podcast if we get into that. Well, it's interesting even from a publishing point of view because this song in its current form, without Shannon's drum line, that makes this what it is. I can understand like, okay, I've got the sheet music that just has the melody and I can sell it and people can play it on piano. Do something that has almost nothing in common with the arrangement that you're hearing here. And in that sense, it's still the same song. And so, yeah, you're the writer of that song. Is it just a matter of sort of who, like I saw uh, Sonny's band, like all the songs are just credited to him? Like, is it a little bit arbitrary in terms of whether you end up getting a writing credit or not for, you know, coming up with the bass part, for instance, or the drummer does? I mean, you're asking two questions. To answer the thing as far as Power Tools and Shannon's music, I mean, there's a record of Shannon's music that's just piano. Gotcha. And Gary Lucas used to play uh, Howard Beach Memoirs. I don't know if he's still playing it, but he would play it as a solo guitar piece. Hmm. You know what I mean? So the piece can stand on its own without the musicians. Having said that, there's a business interest involved in it. There's, you know, the business interest intervenes with how things are credited sometimes. I think the, the way it's landed for my set of people is kind of like, if you were in the room when the thing was created, you're part of the writing team. So that song I wrote in my house by myself and the guys helped me interpret it. So in terms of how it looks to the business, it's my song. But then in terms of that gets into the, the sort of intricacies of publishing. I mean, on a technical level, the composition would be mine, but the recording would be the groups. And of course, a lot of jazz is playing the covers, essentially, you know, things from the tradition. And the fact that you're completely deconstructing them or screwing around with it, that doesn't mean you get to put your name next to Miles Davis's, right? <laughs> like, I, we co-wrote the song with Miles Davis. Hey, look. No, it's, it's an interpretation. It's an arrangement. But it's actually the other way around. I mean, how we do it in Tubman is everything. Well, that's not true because Terra and the Beauty kind of predate, not predated Tubman, but it was out of Tubman's concept. And the other song that recorded, that's mine. We have very rare exceptions where songs will be credited to one individual. Mm -hmm. But the usual way of doing it is if somebody brings the song to the band, we split the publishing because that's how it works. With Miles, I mean, at the risk of opening up a can of worms, <coughs> that's a music business can of worms. This was a thing in the 80s. I mean, you know, you have a lot of very famous pop stars that have their names on songs that they didn't have anything to do with developing. They're performing it, and the performance is what makes it valuable, so therefore they get to put their name on it. 
And I will say that Miles is later, you know, definitely the band that's just a band that was most informative to me personally, which is the 70s band. That band was a group construction. So it could be arguable who wrote what. But because Miles was the sort of business focus, that's where the money got aimed. And that is very common. Now, you know, in the dance world, you have ghost writers where somebody else will write the track for the DJ. I mean, these are the kind of the things in the music business that people outside of the music business don't know. It's not necessarily their concern, but it's our concern as creators because it becomes a question of, okay, how are we going to continue if we've developed Composition X and everybody else People in the business may or may not know that person X actually wrote piece of music X, but people outside of the business look at it and they look at person X as a great film composer or person Y as a great music composer, and they don't know what actually, how the sausage was made. So it becomes a question, you know, it's a bit of both. In the jazz world, we tend, in general, with the people I work with, at this point, I try not to work with people who aren't going to be giving in terms of, okay, I was in the room when the thing got written, so I should get some credit. But that's just to kind of round us up. That's kind of the basic rule in 2021. If you were in the room when the thing was written, then you get credit. If you weren't in the room and came in afterwards, then you don't necessarily get credit. Sure. So this song, like the last song, has this kind of structure where, you know, you've got the melody, you've got the B section. But then at some point it spirals into this long middle solo section where you're basically launching into space. And all three of you are just going full bore, and then calms back down. But again, kind of like the last song, the drums are still, I mean, in this case, the drums were already very frenetic right from the beginning with that very distinctive riff, such that the end of the song ends up being basically drum solos over you guys, the other two of you hitting chords. You said this was not very practiced or how much of this was just completely like in terms of how much airspace is going to go to which instrument. Maybe it's just that in a trio, you don't have to worry about that so much. You can just be sensitive to each other. And you knew because it was written, you know, how what it was going to end. Well, before I say that, I, I think of the story that's attributed to Picasso may be true, may not be true, but it's a great story anyway. What I do know is true is that Picasso was famously sort of cheap. And one of his methods for getting out of paying stuff is that he would pay with art. So apparently the story goes he was in a restaurant. You know, I don't know if he'd already paid for dinner. Anyway, he was there and he was talking to some hoity-toity and the woman was like, oh, you're an artist. Can you do something right now? And uh, he's kind of like, yeah. And he, he drew a painting and the woman reached out to grab to keep it. And he was kind of like, that'll be $10,000. But you got to remember, in those days, you could buy a house with $10,000. She was kind of like, but it only took you 30 seconds to do that. He said, no, ma'am, it took me my whole life. So... That's kind of what we're talking about. Did we rehearse or did we not rehearse? I mean, you have to put in a whole life experience of the musicians before you kind of to answer that question. Having said that, you know, Shannon heard the melody. And, and of course, looking at the title, he knew the story. So he knew it was, you know, it's an explosive thing. I mean, we're black men. So he had his thing that he wanted to add to it. And that's what he wanted to add. So I didn't, you know, I was kind of like, of course. So we just kind of did it. But I believe we had one, again, like the Sonny thing with Sonny Chirac, I believe we had one rehearsal where we kind of went over these songs and then that was it. Well, to wrap up here, I wanted to have another one of your more produced things. So Canto por Odudua uh, featuring Pedrito Martinez and Pete Cozy, who has since passed away, but a Miles Davis sideman from your Melvin Gibbs Elevated Entity, Ancient Speak, 2009. Can you just say a few words about that before we send folks off? That was something that is funny. A bunch of people have asked me to remix this record because now this Afrobeats thing and now African derived music is like a thing that people are into and it's popular. You know, you got Wizkid and Burner Boy and all of that. But the basic conceit of that record was I wanted to combine African religious music with Hip hop and funk. And Pedrito Martinez is the person who's most renowned in America for Afro Cuban religious singing. And P. Cozy is one of the greatest guitar players of all time. And also on the keyboards, I have an old friend of mine, Mark Batson, who worked with Jay Z for years to bring in a hip hop element. So I kind of wanted to combine these three things in one track. And that's what that track is. And am I right that the drums are mostly programmed on this so that we're hearing your vision of the rhythms? Yeah, the main beat, the drums are programmed. Then JT played along. We went in the studio, me, JT, and Pete, and we played. Pete took his solo, and then I came back and put the track together. Well, this is a very fun one. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. 
All right, here is Canto por Odudua.
Thanks so much to Melvin, though I did not know who he was before going into this. As I researched, as I listened, I was just entranced by his bass style, completely honored to talk to him. He's done so much great stuff. I will link to more of his work that we didn't even get to talk about, like that Zigzag Power Trio, another recent album, the group Social Librium that he mentioned with Bernie Worrell. He co-wrote some important tunes like Liar by Rollins Band, that's Henry Rollins from Black Flag, and his bass playing provides a prime determinant of the sound of a lot of Ardo Lindsay's work, as well as Sonny Chirac that he mentioned and Ronald Shannon Jackson. So you can find all that on the show notes that I wrote for this episode at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. If you want my more detailed breakdown of the songs, support me at patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. I will share that with you. Next up on the podcast, I've got another jazz thing, Emma Jean Thackray, who, like Melvin, is not just a jazz player. She's a trumpeter, but she's also a singer-songwriter, plays keyboards and guitar and other things and programs, and is, like Melvin, very thoughtful about what she does. I'm super honored also to have just interviewed Devo's Jerry Casale, who is the primary lyricist, one of the guys who came up with that whole concept of Devo, super just philosophical guy. Make sure you're subscribed directly to the Nakedly Examined Music Podcast on the podcast app of your choice or see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. Since we've last talked, my band has played two outdoor shows, which were super fun, not Sure, I'm going to do any more of that right away, given COVID stuff, but maybe. I've also just become an empty nester. My daughter has gone up to college, and my wife has gone back to working at the office. So at least theoretically, I can make a lot of noise around the house. Maybe that will parlay into some recordings. We'll see. Hope you're doing well. Keep inspired. Until next time, keep on musicking. This is Mark Lindsay Meyer signing off.